Madam Chair, the meeting has been sent live. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is the uh, planning North uh, West Planning Advisory Committee uh, meeting on Zoom because of the COVID restrictions. And uh, we will begin our meeting tonight by calling the meeting to order and uh, having a roll call. I will begin with Vice Chair Nick Horn. Good evening. Councillor Kathy Diggle-Gammon. Good evening, Madam Chair, colleagues, staff. Deputy Mayor Tim Oathit, I believe, sent regrets. Member Ryan Donato. Not here. Jordan Foster. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Jordan. Uh, Gina Jones-Wilson. Okay. Jacqueline Lever. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hello, Jacqueline. Donalda McIsaac. Good evening, everyone. And Stacy Rutterham. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Stacy. And I've lost you on my screen. I don't see you, but okay. There you are. <laughs> I, I find it so hard to find people on this screen sometimes. Okay. We also have a guest this evening. Uh, uh, Councillor Lisa Blackburn is joining us for this evening. Uh, welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be your uh, interloper this evening. I'm just going to sit in and listen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, staff members present are Shane Vipon, planner for case number 21639. Stephanie Saloum, planner for case number 21639. Jennifer Chapman, planner case 23213 and case 21826. And uh, Maggie Holm, Principal Planner, Urban Enabled Applications, Alicia Wall, Legislative Support, Andrea Lavassi Wood, our Legislative Assistant, Chris Devining, a legis our Legislative Assistant as backup. Okay, we'll begin with approval of the minutes of August 4th and August 18th public information meeting. Uh, the August 4th meeting was our regular meeting. On August 18th, we had a public information meeting. If someone would uh, move the adoption of those minutes. So move, Madam Chair. Uh, can I have your name, please? I wasn't oh, looking. All right. Kathy Diggle-Gammon. Okay. Councillor Diggle-Gammon has moved. And seconder? Nick Horn will second. Nick. Okay. It's been moved by Kathy Diggle Gammon and seconded by Nick Horn that we accept the minutes of the August 4th and August 18th meetings. Are there any errors or omissions? None being given, I will call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary minded. Motion is carried. We'll move on to the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. If there are any added items at special meetings, they require a unanimous vote from all members, regardless of whether they are present. Are there any additions or modifications to the agenda, Clerk? Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. There are no additions or deletions to the agenda. Thank you very much. Are there any further uh, modifications? Would uh, Do any of the members have any requests to change the order of anything in the agenda? Okay. Then can I have an, a motion to approve the agenda, please? So move, Nick Horn. Second it. Objection, Nevada. Jacqueline. It's been moved and seconded by Nick and, ja and Jacqueline Lever to uh, approve the agenda as issued. Um, I'll call for the question to approve the agenda as circulated. 
All those in favor, signify by, by saying aye. 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 Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. I'll call for a declaration of conflict of interests. Anyone having any conflict with any of the items that we're going to be looking at tonight, please declare it now. Hearing none, I'll assume there are no conflicts of interest. Consideration of deferred business, there is none. Correspondence, petitions, and delegations. Uh, Clerk, has there been any uh, correspondence received? Madam Chair, no correspondence was received by the clerk's office. Thank you. Are there any petitions? Madam Chair, no petitions were received by the clerk's office. Thank you. And the presentations, we have none. So we'll move on to reports. Uh, 7.1 staff, 7.1.1 case number 21639, Middle Sackville Master Plan Phase 1. It's a regional subdivision bylaw amendment, a review of the growth management area policies that restrict the limit of development of the Indigo Shores subdivision to 25 lots per calendar year. Uh, I believe Shane is going to make the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll share the screen. Thank you. Does everyone see that? Yes. So uh, this item obviously is not new for the committee. Uh, we've discussed it several times. Uh, so much of this will be review, particularly for those that were able to be in attendance for the PIM uh, that occurred uh, last month. Now, um, in terms of this particular uh, recommend or rather uh, presentation, we are seeking a recommendation from the committee on this particular item. So that this is somewhat different from, from presentations past. Uh, we're at a point now in the planning process where we're winding it down. We've got some, uh, some additional contacts and uh, consultation uh, to occur being the school board, but uh, we're at the point where we feel comfortable in asking the committee for their recommendation, whatever that may be. So uh, I'll just go through some review of this uh, process and uh, the project overall. And uh, I'll try to be brief, uh, but I will sort of midway through the process uh, be stopping to explain a little bit about what we're really asking the, kit, the committee to consider. So as you know, this is part of the Marston Drive Master Plan project as, as the presentation outline um, stipulates here, and we're really focusing on the first phase of the master plan, which deals with growth management policies uh, and the phase one proposal. And the, uh, we'll talk a bit about that as we get in um, in further, uh, obviously the planning process for phase one and then the recommendation from the committee, ultimately uh, assuming uh, after questions uh, are asked. So just for, uh, for review sake, this particular area is in an urban local growth center as identified through the regional plan. Um, and uh, because it is in an urban local growth center, uh, it has enabling policy for the regional plan S9. And so it's considered uh, comprehensively. That is to say that there are a number of issues within the master plan structure that we would be looking at. And these are listed here, in addition to the driver, which is a community vision and the uh, addition of priority plans, such as the Green Network Plan, integrated mobility, all of these other facets will be considered when looking at uh, applying the policies to the, the master plan lands. Of course, this is uh, located in, uh, at the interchange of Highway 101 and Marston Drive and includes uh, McCabe, Lord, McCabe Lake North 
as uh, phase one, as you can see here. So the, the master plan area is broken into three phases for purposes of implementation, or at least uh, to provide the appropriate deliverables and to create a manageable project plan. Uh, I do want to mention that we did bring a, uh, a report to regional council recently uh, requesting that we strike a subcommittee for the purposes of uh, studying phases two and three. They've approved that. And on the 13th of September, we are going to Northwest Community Council to request that they strike the committee. Um, it's two levels of authority. Uh, so we anticipate that that will happen on that date. So in terms of the PAC, um, certainly we are, are inviting members of PAC to sit on that subcommittee when it is struck. And we can talk about that at another date. But for today's focus, we are really looking at these areas uh, identified as seven or phase one. Um, and it, it really, uh, we're limited in that respect to, uh, to the purview of the growth management policies from a planning and policy perspective as it relates to, uh, to these areas. Oops, something happened there. Apologies. Let me see if I can get back here. Oh. So uh, the master plan, um, it, it, the actual uh, policies apply to these areas in red. Excuse me, Shane. Yes. Um, I can't. Um, I can't see your presentation. Would you like me to share mine? No, I. Um, no, let me try this again. I'll go back. How about that? Uh, yes, I just need it full screen. Yeah. Okay, we're... There Does we go. Work? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Say, yeah. Seeing slide seven. Uh, technology is wonderful. Okay, so uh, the actual application or the actual policy area is in the Indigo Shore subdivision. This is a 480 lot subdivision. Um, Indigo Shores, the actual policy area governs approximately 185 lots, 25 of which um, are entitled through the year 2021. So we're really talking about 160 lots of the total. Um, and so this is really to deal with the growth management objectives that are applied through the regional subdivision bylaw. And it's about limiting the growth of development or the rate of development to 25 lots per year. What does that mean? Well, um, in these particular, so it lives in Schedule H of the uh, regional subdivision bylaw, um, but the strategy for implementation of the 25 lots per year limit is basically uh, to sit to stem sprawl, to reduce traffic conge congestion, and to look at um, the infrastructure costs uh, when development is not applied strategically across the area. So that really brings us to the original objectives of the growth management policies, as you see here. And that is uh, this non-strategic development um, when applying the growth restrictions uh, leads to all types of problems with respect to financial implications, uh, servicing requirements, and uh, the load of traffic on various traffic routes. So this is really uh, the, the meat of this discussion in terms of are these objectives being met in Indigo Shores as they were originally envisioned when the policies were applied. Um, now, back when these policies were applied, uh, there were concerns about leapfrogging development, as you can see here. That is where uh, you see development in one parcel, in one location, and then uh, maybe two or three or half a kilometer down the road, another, another development begins. And it's not, it's not, uh, feasible from a financial perspective to continue to service those particular developments. And so 
that's all part and parcel of the original objective to applying these. And they were done by a number of instruments in the growth management policies. Uh, Schedule H, which is the 25 lots per year requirement is what we're dealing with here tonight. Uh, and so we really look to these kind of four objectives that were originally envisioned. And we ask ourselves from a planning perspective, um, is that being achieved now in the current and existing situation uh, of in the Inigo Shores development? And, and we have that authority to look at it on the basis of S9 that was uh, previously identified through the regional plan. So these are the areas uh, that I mentioned. Again, 160 lots are really the subject of discussion. Uh, we're talking a seven to eight year build out of those 160 lots. If uh, the growth management policy uh, continues to prevail on these lands, as opposed to uh, maybe a two to three year build out if it is lifted. So that's the distinction. It's about a five year difference now, uh, depending on what happens with the market and all these other things uh, that are um, typical of what's going on in our, our building environment today. So, a quite, so another thing we ask when evaluating this is, well, what has changed? Certainly the initiation of the master plan process is fundamentally a a difference in how we would view these. For example, we see that there are other uh, situations where we have um, we have subdivision approvals in growth centers. Uh, in I think there are four or five examples of that. But the difference is that there hasn't been a larger policy program initiated by council to study it. And that's where this particular circumstance differs. In addition, because this is a grandfathered approval, that is to say that it was most of the subdivision was approved as of right, um, then we know that, uh, that the 480 lots is, is entrenched, if you will. That is, there is a, a right. Um, for those number of units and the, the overall unit count can't be changed uh, irrespective of what happens with the growth management policies. But the question is, because there is a pre-existing approval, what impact does the growth management have on the intent of the growth management policies? In other words, because it was already in place, was it effective to apply the growth management policies to these lands from their outset? And, and there are arguments on both sides of that. And then of course, when we look to uh, the impacts to feeder roads or adjacent roads, for example, when the growth management policies were applied, they certainly had Beaver Bank Road and Hammonds Plains Road um, uh, as two examples of overloaded, crowded right-of-ways that were impossible, not impossible, but very difficult at peak uh, traffic hours. Um, and so as a result of that, all of the secondary roads and outlets, the subdivisions were also loaded. And so that was also an objective and one that they, they sought to uh, alleviate by applying the growth management. In this particular case, uh, we know that Marchson Drive is the only access to, uh, to the uh, Inigo Shore subdivision, which means that uh, there are no secondary roads in order to be overpopulated. So the question that, that we need to ask as a result of that is, well, what is the impact to Marchson Drive and the Highway 101 as a result of this subdivision? at 480 lots and at the rate of development. So we asked those questions and were supplied with a traffic study and the traffic study determined that there were no undue impacts as a result of lifting the growth management policies, uh, no undue impacts to Marsden Drive or to Highway 101. So we then took it out to the PIM uh, last month and um, we received a number of correspondence, I think maybe five or six in total, um, 
the vast vast majority were concerned about schools and about the the deficits in schools and about the concern of um, of removing growth management because of the impact it might have on schools. And there were other things like the concern of the notification area. Uh, there was some support to move forward with it on the basis of uh, the need for additional housing stock. But principally, um, I think that the theme that came out of the PIM was we've got an issue with schools and there's some local concern uh, with community members. And we don't take that lightly. We understand that that is a, a cause for some angst for parents. And um, so uh, one of the results of that PIM, uh, although we did reach out prior to the public information meeting, we have gone back and drafted a letter and sent it to the school board with the hopes of having a face-to-face -face meeting to uh, discuss their issues. We know council will probably be interested in that. Um, Again, with, with respect to our position, uh, we've got uh, a provincial uh, authority with their mandate with respect to the requirement to support and resource schools and, and school student populations. And uh, we're at the municipal level. So um, we, certainly, uh, we certainly would like to work with the school board and and we do that we do give them statistics so uh, we'll await the result of that meeting uh, hopefully that will be within the next uh, few weeks certainly we won't be drafting the report until we have that meeting um, so that that still remains to be done so where are we in the process well we're here at the planning advisory committee for a recommendation the uh, refinement portion, which follows, is, is just that, to talk about um, the implications of schools and, and the school board mandate with them relative to our particular proposal here, or rather the proposal that's on the table. It's not ours. Uh, uh, well, technically, I guess it is HRM's because it's a part of the master plan, but uh, in terms of the, the stakeholder's interest, um, uh, of removing the, uh, the growth management policies. We'll talk, we'll discuss the, the implications of that with the school board. Uh, they've indicated back to us that they're preparing something. So uh, we await that. Once we're through that, we feel we have enough uh, to, uh, to draft the staff report with the recommendation. Certainly tonight is uh, pivotal, to, pivotal to that uh, endeavor. And we'll take that forward to community council and then ultimately to regional council. Okay, so the big question is, does the Northwest Planning Advisory Committee support the removal of the growth management area policies that limit the rate of development of 25 lots per calendar year in the Indigo Shore subdivision? So I'm available for uh, certainly for questions at this point, if there are any or clarifications. My role here is just to provide you with uh, information. I have, uh, and, um, and uh, I don't have an opinion at this point, one way or the other. Um, we haven't drafted the report, so the recommendation isn't finalized, but I am certainly here to share uh, anything that I can with the committee to clarify any of the issues. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back. Thank you very much, Shane. And um, yeah, okay, I will now go through my list and uh, ask each member for questions and comments on what they've what we've been asked here tonight. And I'll begin with uh, our vice chair, Nick Horn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, not too, too many questions other than um, I, I feel like with our current housing crisis, this measures like this should be being actively undertaken by uh, regional council and planning for sure to help speed up the inventory of space available to build. Um, I, I guess one, one question is, um, what is the planning department's comfort level on um, rapid growth, uh, you know, being able to maintain 
our our infrastructures you know are we going to skip steps here are we going to are we going to have um things forgotten about like say you know for example in bedford west um i think transit was was sort of something that was thought of after the fact so i i, I guess I, I i'm supportive as long as everything is done um you know in a conscious manner sorry my dogs are in front of me here thanks okay thank Do you like me to speak to that uh, uh yes if you could briefly uh answer the question there certainly um i think we we drafted a comprehensive project plan for phases two and three um so that we don't run into problems of trying to uh trying to deal with issues that we've forgotten after the fact. So this is, this is only phase one to deal with growth management, but we have all of those components already, uh, already outlined in a, a full scale project plan, which I will present to the new subcommittee when the time is right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jordan. Jordan Foster. Hey. Uh, hey. Um, I think I said this last time we talked about this one. Um, I think growth management kind of in general is a good practice, but I don't know if 25 is necessarily the right number depending on different circumstances. Um, so I certainly wouldn't advocate for removing the limit, but perhaps amending the limit might be appropriate to say 40 houses per year or something just depending on demand and uh, like construction throughput and all that. So that's all I'll add right now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Gina? Gina Jones Wilson. Uh, my only question would be: um, Is it affordable housing, or is that something you don't uh, really know right now? Or I'm not really. I don't really know where Indigo. I have never been there, so I'm just wondering if you know if these if these homes actually going to help with our housing here. Uh, our housing problem here, which is not is really more affordable housing than is just as um, not being able to build. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, yes. there is no. Uh, this is about the rate of growth of uh, development. So there is no affordable housing mandate okay. on this particular uh, this particular project, um, and. So it would be done on a market basis. So it's really just about, the question is about the rate of development um, and not the affordability. Okay. Oh, thank you. That's, your, that's it for you, Gina? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Jacqueline Lever. Thank you, Chair. I'm very, very, very concerned because I've been through it myself with the school and with the school population and the school uh, overpopulation. And I don't understand why we as a municipality do not have a direct line when doing this planning with the Department of Education and with the school board and that that's not in our first steps instead of our last steps. I've been on the receiving the end of this as a principal of a school as Larry Utec was being developed and not knowing how many houses were being planned and developed and having no information and then finding myself with 600 students in a school built for you know 300 and some. So it's, it's a very frustrating process that we can't get this right and that we can't get it to not hurt when we're doing, I believe in development, I believe in intensification, I believe in why we want uh, to uh, build more houses because it's needed. But why is it that if nobody answers at the school board that we're not, nobody's pursuing that? Did we send the email to the wrong person? Did that person quit the school board do we just give up at that point like it, it it's just it seems there should be a process that's that's better and and now we don't you know the province has taken away the school boards and there is a direct line to the department because the superintendent 
answers directly to the deputy minister. So why aren't we talking to the deputy minister about all these developments that are happening that will put pressure on schools so that we're preparing that? Because I say this with the full knowledge of how long it takes to get approval from the province for either a bigger school or changes to a school for renovations or even modular classrooms to be added. So we, we need to do this better. So I am not comfortable changing that 25 until we get the information and we say the meeting is down the pipes. I'm not comfortable with that chair about that process being not done before we make that decision. Okay, thank you. And Shane, would you like to respond to anything that? Sure. Um, so we do, when, when a subdivision comes in at concept level and every stage where there is subdivision approval where it's modified within stages within the subdivision, we send uh, those numbers to the school board. Now we do that as a courtesy because we're a lower level of government. So, um, and I think the last speaker was quite right. This rests with the province. It's their responsibility and their mandate. So we do, but, but I wanna frame this correctly. It's a courtesy that we do. They do their data mining in order to forecast their populations and allocate their resources. And uh, they do that. And we are prepared to share our information and we do so. The question though is, um, does that result in the ad adequate resources in order to fulfill their mandate? And that, that is something that probably at the municipal level, we would have difficulty deciding since we have no power. Um, from that perspective, it's not in our mandate, not in our legislative authority. But I agree that, uh, that there, there is always room for improvement. So the process is that when those subdivisions come in, we do send them out to the province, we do send those numbers and uh, they receive those numbers. Um, and from there, then they have to do their forecasting and their resource allocation. And um, that unfortunately, from our perspective, I believe is where it ends unless we're asked to supply additional statistical information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shane. And Jacqueline, is that everything you needed to know? <laughs> I guess, I, Chair, I'd like to people around the table to understand, having been part of that process on the other end, that unless communities are aware that this is coming down the pipes also, so CEC, uh, I'm trying to translate in my head, but the, the committees that work at a school level, the school government, level, mm -hmm. unless they're aware that these are coming and they fight with their board to get better, like to, to, for the schools to be adapted to the new reality, there is often nothing that happens. So it's, it's about thinking about also how can we inform our community so that they can get organized and let their board know, which the, the boards don't exist anymore. So I guess they would go to their, their local government and their schools. But right now, because of all those changes to the education system, I'm afraid that a lot of these things get dropped into holes and cracks. And, and um, so we need to be aware that there is difficulty on that end of getting organized in terms of the province. So even though it's not our responsibility, we do not want to do harm to students and schools. So it, it's finding that middle road about how do we uh, communicate to make sure that the school board is, to, or that we don't even want to call them school board anymore, that the school regional center, <laughs> that the regional centers for education are actually uh, taking this information and, and, and making the, the, the moves that need to be done so that the existing you know, uh, that, that are arriving with more houses is not gonna harm the students that are already in that school. So I guess okay. it's, it's, the process is a little bit broken in my opinion. So in, in how it all works, not how Shane does his job or our employees do their jobs, Chair, but more 
all of the systems. So we need to think about, or so it needs to be somewhere in the recommendation that we're worried about how that, the impact and how we can make sure we don't do harm. Okay, thank you very much, Jacqueline. Okay, Donelda, questions and comments? You're, yeah, okay, there you go. Um, I just want to say how much I agree with um, a lot of what Jacqueline has been sharing. Uh, there's, there's a lot of um, concern already in communities uh, about portables, just too many portables in the area and people are upset with that. One of my biggest concerns is traffic. Um, I'm really surprised every time I hear that the traffic study says that there's no impact to traffic. That always interests me because the reality is after the subdivisions are put in, the people living in those communities actually deal with the problems of the traffic. So um, I don't know um, how comfortable I am um, having it removed as well because I'm not clear myself personally on that there won't be a traffic issue. So I think what I'd like to see is that we do everything we can to make sure that any recommendations that we put forward, make sure that people aren't going to be dealing with these issues five years down the road after everything's already in there. That's where the problem becomes. People can't get solutions to it. So I think it's really important that we um, are very careful how we um, give our recommendations um, going forward. And I would just like to see us make sure that we have all the information that we need going forward. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, Stacy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also agree with Jacqueline's um, concerns about the uh, increase in, in population at the school. I, I listened to uh, the speakers at the PIM outline some really concerning elements of what is already occurring in, in the local school at, uh, I think it's Sackville Heights Elementary is what the school was uh, listed as um, with regard to the portables, with the regard to uh, loss of outdoor play space, um, a lack of washroom facilities, et cetera. Those are a lot of really big concerns within a school. And as a parent, um, you know, we've been dealing with with a lot of uh, talk about overcrowded schools for quite a long time at the provincial level. And, and so I, I feel a little bit obligated to take those into consideration, uh, you know, as a group here, you know, when we're talking about what impacts we might be imposing on on the local, not just the elementary school, but the junior high and the high school. Um, I wonder why we're having a discussion tonight about a resolve on a recommendation without having heard what the school board has to say about the uh, current situation uh, with the schools. Why would we not have that part, that as part of our information from staff as well, so that we know that whatever decision we're making is actually, um, you know, taking a full accounting of, of everything that we can possibly know about all of this. Um, Shane, one of the things that you had mentioned um, through you, Madam Chair, uh, was the fact that these proposals are always sent off to the school board uh, for their knowledge and, and information purposes. I wonder if this amendment has been sent off to the school board prior to this meeting that you're going to be having. If, if, if this is something, you know, have they had any time to look at this before you go to the meeting and, and come back with any feedback or, or, or whatever, because that would really be an important thing for our committee to know uh, if, there's, if there's an opportunity for them to come up with a decision in the short term, or if this is something that's gonna be drawn out for, for a longer time for consideration. And um, also during the PIM, there were some concerns raised that I don't think we've talked about yet tonight about the impacts that a higher uh, volume of development might have on the local waterways and the lakes. And that is something that I think that as a municipality, we do need to see more um, care and concern. I know that that's a provincial area again, but I do think that when it comes to living in these communities, um, that part of, of, of a development is a really integral uh, piece for consideration. You know, here in Fall River, we have every single one of our lakes with blue-green algae this summer, uh, as of today or as of Friday, I guess. And so, 
Um, development does have impacts on the waterways, and I and I do wonder why we're not maybe collaborating a little bit more with the province on that element of development as well. So, okay, thank you, Stacy and Shane. Would you like to uh, comment on the, those questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. So. Um, during my presentation, when I talked to the committee, I actually elaborated on what the committee's purview was relative to the objectives of the growth management policy. Now, it, the objectives of the growth management policy were clear in that they were about alleviating traffic on, uh, on feeder roads, secondary roads, um, you know, disincentivizing leapfrogging development, trying to maximize uh, the efficiencies of development, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I understand that the issue of schools is an important topic for members of the community, but it isn't really within the purview of whether or not the growth management policies should be removed. It is, it is a discussion, but it is not within our municipal authority to be able to affect and impact the provincial le level of uh, responsibility that the school board, school board has to service the student populations. I understand that it is related. So, uh, and I understand that uh, regional council will be interested in this discussion. And we are making sure that we sit down and have that conversation so that we can elaborate. And we certainly will address this in the report. But the real issue here is, are the objectives of the growth management policies being met in this development? Um, school allocations and resource allocations weren't uh, a primary consideration when the policies were put on. Uh, and they, they are related, as is the nature of planning comprehensively, we need to look at all facets to determine whether or not we're planning uh, or meeting good planning principles. But when we're dealing with something where we've got a higher level of government and their responsibility is to allocate resources, it's not incumbent upon us as a lower authority who make our statistics and population forecasts available to then ask them to coordinate more efficiently or improve their process so they can meet their needs, their requirements. Now I understand, uh, so what I'm trying to do is draw a distinction between um, what our objectives are here this evening and the whole discussion about schools and the overloading of schools, which the municipality can't impact anyway because we don't have that legislative authority. We can, and, and you're right, there's always room for improvement, but we don't have a say um, in that perspective necessarily. That's not to say that uh, we can't have some form of collaboration and we try with the submission of our statistics, but uh, our focus is on land use and land use policy. And uh, so just to bring this point home, any other as a right subdivision would be entitled to subdivision approval. They wouldn't go through this discussion in order to determine whether or not they would meet with the school board's uh, defined elements, resources, allocation, the, their operational program. So that wouldn't be a fundamental requirement to meet. Uh, it just so happens that we're talking about the growth management policies and that's why we're here. I understand the distinction may be difficult, but uh, it is nuanced and, and I understand where, um, where it might, there might be some overlap. So I'll leave it there. Um, now in terms of the water course protection, I'll remind uh, the committee that this is a pre-existing subdivision approval. Um, so this is done uh, as of right as a right development. So there's no discretionary requirement of, uh, for a case-by-case -case decision of council for, for the Inigo Shore subdivision. So built within the subdivision agreements, 
are things like erosion and sedimentation control uh, that are intended to, to mitigate impacts to the water courses. When it, uh, so that is already entrenched in the subdivision agreement um, going forward. And, and it is uh, intended to protect the water courses. But, but when it comes to discretionary approvals, that is phase two and phase three of the master plan, we can do better. And we are planning to do better by identifying floodplain zones and large setbacks and uh, water course impact mitigation. So we don't have any ability to impact what is already a previously approved subdivision, but we do have the ability going forward to employ uh, additional lever levels of higher mitigation in order to offset some of those impacts to the water course, and we'll be doing that. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Shane. Uh, Case, uh, can you just hold your question for one minute, Stacy, uh, while we finish up with Councillor Deagle Gammon, and then if there are other questions, we can come back to you. Well, this was relative to what Shane just said to me. Um, so, okay, if it's if it's something, okay, go ahead then. So the mitigating um, measures that you talk about that are in place with the development agreement originally were based on a delayed 25 uh, per unit limit um, in development, are they not? No, 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 only there, this is a 480 lot subdivision. Um, there are only 160 lots left under interim control. Most of the subdivision was done as of right. And so most of it is already built out. So there were only two portions within the interior of the subdivision where the growth management policy is applied. Okay. Is that, that answer your question, Stacy? I guess so. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Shane. Okay, thank you, Stacy. Councillor Diggle Gammon. Thank you very much. Um, I, I kind of feel like this is a place where Shane you know, your job is to keep us in a box and none of us want to stay in the box. Yeah. Um, so, right. We're, we're all thinking about bigger than just this, but thinking about complete communities and trying to figure out that we know that we're making or, or I guess I, I know that we make a recommendation and that there are other levels beyond us uh, that will make some final decisions about it. Um, but the, the whole thing I'm hoping is that when you get to the regional plan work, we figure out how do we intersect? How do we, uh, as a municipal unit, intersect with the province in a much better way so that we can build a, completer communities? And part of that, we see schools as part of the infrastructure. And so for me, if we build beyond 25 lots per year, the infrastructure cannot support it. And I see schools as part of that infrastructure. I see, uh, even though we said that traffic study works, you know what, I'll read them till the day I die and never understand them. <laughs> I'm just gonna be playing with that because they all seem, seem to say that it's all good. But um, that's more about my brain's ability to process that information than anybody else's. But um, so yeah, for me, I'm, I am really worried about going beyond the 25 lots and to go from 25, like right to 160. Um, and I know it would reduce the timeline from seven years to two years, I believe you said, Shane, was it? Three to, three to seven to eight. So five years difference, I would say. Five years difference. And that, that's, uh, that's, that's guesswork because we don't know what the market is going to do. It's all supposing. Right? It, exactly. And, and right now, you know, with the lack of inventory, people are going to want to build as fast as they can because they're going to be able to sell them as fast as they can, I think. So, you know, we do know that we need the stock. I am concerned about, you know, a complete communities kind of concept that we can bring to these kinds of conversations. And I think the other thing is that we're in a transition with a new government. Um, and I, I believe I read this morning in a news article that this particular uh, new government, one of their platforms is to reinstate school boards. So I, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it may be uh, something that will impact how they can respond to the questions that um, planning has presented to them, Shane. So that, that could be something. So I think that in at the end of the day, my recommendation is not to go beyond the 25 per year, but maybe they could come back next year once we have some information or we pause this recommendation until we have an answer um, that helps us understand about building a, a better community. So I, I don't know, Shane, how that works or not. I know that 
you know, we've got a timeline, we've got a graph about what the steps are. And so I, I don't know if that's possible or not, but if it's not possible, then I think Personally, I, I think that staying at 25 per year meets the community, um, complete communities kind of conversation, but letting it go to the 160 helps with our inventory of housing. So uh, we need to sort of balance those two things and I'm interested in the rest of the conversation and where we might go. That's where I'm at. Okay, thank you. And Shane, do you want to comment on the? No, uh, staff are here to solely to get a recommendation. I, this is a this is a difficult one for all of the um, all of the fullness of the argument and the fullness of the discussion. And my job here is simply to ensure that everyone understands um, the relative position. Uh, but the Northwest Planning Advisory Committee will make their recommendation, and we'll take that forward to council. Okay. Okay, um, and it's my turn. Uh, I, I don't, I'm having a problem with the whole idea, uh, simply because the restrictions were put there for a reason. And I'm not sure that those reasons have changed at all. I don't, I don't think there's been anything happening that um, has made it reasonable to actually build at will sort of thing. Um, I can't, again, I can't, I can't see how they can, how we can ignore all the forces that come get together on a subdivision after it's built while we're looking at whether it should be built. We have to, we have to consider uh, traffic. We have to consider schools. We have to consider all all the services that people will demand after a subdivision is there. Because I know it always used to start off that there was no cost to the municipality. But hey, <laughs> maybe today there's no cost, but will there be tomorrow? And I think that's why we're so hesitant, I think most of us anyway are hesitant about removing that uh, 25 per year, or perhaps as Jordan suggested, maybe we could look at increasing it by a little bit if we really feel it's necessary, but I'm going to be quiet now <laughs> and ask, um, someone on the committee to make the a motion um, and that everyone can add their concerns to that motion. Madam Chair, uh, it's Nick. Yes. Um, we were going to go around the table once more for, oh. for the comment. Okay. Um, if... I, I have a little bit of further comment if that's available. Okay, uh, we can we can try that if we do it quickly because we have other things to look at tonight too. Sure. Okay, so and begin I, with I'm, you. Thank you. Nick. I'm going to flip it on its head a little bit with the concerns about schooling and traffic and um, infrastructure. Um, my heart really goes out to all of those people in HRM who cannot find a place to live, people who are living in tents, people who are living in basements and sleeping on couches. <laughs> And I, I think we do have to think about that um, over and above whether or not someone's child will have to go to school in a portable or whether or not our government, provincial government, will have to uh, move nimbly to make schooling work for somebody. Um, I think that's more important than um, the things we've discussed here tonight. And I also argue that... Um, no, a good case study is the Beaver Bank Road or the Hammonds Plains Road, which were listed by Mr. Vipond, um, that in eight years, those two roads will still be the same. And a new subdivision is not going to be Oops. Put, put two extra lanes on those roads. So I'm, I'm in support of this uh, because of our housing crisis. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have uh, secondary commentaries? Okay, Stacy, 
We're going to keep it brief. You're muted. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to quickly respond to uh, the housing question. Um, the houses in Indigo Shore are in the 600,000 to $2 million range. We're not talking about affordable housing. We're not talking about resolving any problems with people having housing available to them who are, are now homeless. This is not a solution for, for that. It may help um, offset some of the increase in, in some of the prices on inventory in the city, but not enough to resolve uh, the housing crisis that we're in or, or the, the homelessness uh, concerns in downtown. And I do wonder what has changed um, with regard to uh, the original plan, like what is what is promoting this change? The, 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 present, the presentation that we heard talked a little bit about housing stock. I don't believe that this is the, the main course of action for housing stock concerns in HRM. Um, what, is the, what is the change that enables us to have, um, you know, in our minds that there's, there's th these issues that were being prevented by limiting the 25 units per year, that those, those, those issues don't exist anymore? Uh, from the time that this this uh, uh, um, development agreement was was established, you'd like me to answer that, Madam Yes, Chair? please. So this is located in a, a, an urban local growth center, so it's designated for growth, and the Indigo Shores uh, uh, subdivision. It's, it's a subdivision agreement. Is an allocated population which gives us an advantage in studying the entirety of the plan area. But in terms of, of uh, so in terms of the actual growth center policies, this area is intended to be established with levels of growth. Um, and by virtue of it being initiated as a policy exercise, it is unique, as is the urban local growth center in Middle Sackville from a policy perspective. Um, it's probably unlike any other growth center in HRM in that it shares characteristics of suburban growth, yet it is a rural context. We'll see how long it is rural because of the, the rate of growth of the municipality. And, um, so yeah, housing, housing in terms of uh, addition to housing stock um, can be made at, at, at a regional level, at a high level in terms of every bit, every bit of additional housing stock helps to alleviate the whole, but in terms of housing affordability, this isn't the area that we're looking at. We've, we've heard about complete communities. Uh, we've heard that raised. Um, that's certainly contemplated in the initiation report in part in phases two and three. So phase one is the anchor that provides the population for those services that will be ultimately implemented through phase two and phase three transit, fire, potentially fire, community services, local, uh, local community, um, and in pot potentially institutional uses, seniors housing. Those are all uh, components that are contemplated for those additional, uh, additional phases. But this is, uh, so answer to your question, what has changed? The application and recognition by regional council that, that we are implementing the growth center policies and that these lands have been included as part of that study area, which makes them unique in, uh, in any rural setting in HRM. Thank you, Shane. Okay, I see hands up and I'm going to go to, um, I don't know whose hand went up first, but I'm going to just go to uh, Donalda, then, uh, Councillor Gammon and then Jacqueline. How's that work for you? Okay, Donalda. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think for me, I really don't like when um, we think of Indigo Shores as affordable housing. Um, it is absolutely not affordable housing and I think it does uh, injustice for us to compare this as affordable housing. It's not. Um, 25 houses going up there is quite a few houses going up. And I think for me, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed with the whole um, idea that though there are 
things set in place. And then now we're asked to change those. It brings me to wonder what is our purpose here? For me, I like to think of myself and this committee as being the eyes, ears, and voice of the communities that we are representing and the future committees that we are, communities that we are trying to say go hit with. So I think it's important that for me personally, I like to know why those um, restrictions are there. I'm not comfortable with moving past the 25, but I also really would like to stress the fact that in no way do I ever want to be associated with this being looked at as affordable housing. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, and then I said, Councillor Deagle Gammon. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that, um, you know, the, the, the temperature and the climate of the day very much. I, I really uh, appreciate the concern, Nick, that you, you have raised, right? And because we do need to address those issues. Uh, I don't think it's here, but yes, we need to address those other issues about affordable housing, social housing, all of those kinds of things. Um, and I do take that part very, very seriously. But in this example, um, yeah, I think we're talking about, and I guess the other thing that when, when people bought and built there, they bought and they built or whatever, uh, knowing that they were part of a place that was going to have a managed growth. And so to take away that from maybe something, and, and maybe Shane, they didn't know that in the beginning, I don't know, but um, I would think that if I was moving into a community, I would wanna know, so what is the plan of this subdivision? Uh, will I know how it's going to grow, those kinds of things. So um, I wouldn't want to take away maybe a promise or a commitment that was made there. So uh, just if you could answer that quick question, that would help me too, Shane. Um, no problem through you, Madam Chair. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there were only two portions where within uh, the internal portion of the subdivision uh, okay. where the growth management policies applied. Most of the subdivision was uh, grandfathered and existed in, in advance or approved in advance of the passage of the 2006 regional plan and the growth management policies. So okay. the vast majority of that subdivision didn't have a capped growth rate. It was only those two areas internally. Okay, thanks Dave, that's good. Okay, thank you. And Jacqueline has one last question here. Yeah, perhaps uh, Chair, just a comment. Um, again, I, I feel the same way about affordable housing as the previous speakers. And that was important to me to say that I believe in it too, but I don't think this is where where we solve or contribute to a solution to that problem. Um, but the one thing is, I'm wondering if it's the cart before the horse, where if we have to put a recommendation regarding taking off that uh, 25, you know, we know there's a committee coming up. I'd be more than willing to put uh, my time and effort into contributing to such a committee. But I, I, I really think we need information about from back from the school board and some more research on what the impact is of taking that 25 off, cap off before we take it. So that's my biggest concern, more information and not the cart before the horse. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, everyone else, um, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, none. Okay, I would, uh, uh, Stephanie, did you have something you wanted to add there? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add to what Shane said for the question about what has changed um, since the policy, the growth management policies were adopted. So majority, Shane has said this a few times, the majority of the subdivision has been built out. So it's really looking at the remaining portions of the, of the subdivision. When the growth management policies were applied, uh, there wasn't as much approval as you see today. Um, so it was really considered as that leapfrogging development or, or that was part of the discussion at that time is, is this leapfrogging development uh, where it's a large tract of land that it was undeveloped. But today, most of the lots have been developed and we're only looking at the remaining portions of the subdivision. 
Um, so 160 lots. So that's a big change from when the uh, policies were first adopted. Okay, thank you. Okay, I am going to now ask you to uh, please uh, someone <laughs> make a, a motion as to uh, what we our motions can be to accept, to accept with conditions or recommendations as we call them, or to um, deny. And if we do that, we have to have also reasons for that. So if somebody would like to make a motion We have to do this. I could make a motion saying that we uh, deny based and, and because we need more information uh, based on the impact of, of increasing such as schools and, and how they will be able to absorb the extra population um, and, and even more, inf you know, more information on, I know we, we haven't discussed, for example, the traffic study, like we've been told the traffic study says there won't be an impact, you know, but we've heard concerns about traffic. Um, so I think those would be the two uh, reasons why I think we need more information in general before making such a change. So, okay. So that would that would basically be your uh, recommendation that we um, and I can't think of the exact word there. If somebody mm -hmm. would like to tell me what the, reject what the, reject that's the one uh, <laughs> because we of uh, we feel we need more information. Is that uh, what your motion would read, as Stacy? Um, For me, somebody. information about the impact. Of the, of the decision. Yeah. Madam Chair, it's Alicia. I can um, help you guys out with some wording if you would like. Yeah, uh, Stacy has uh, her finger up there. I think she wants sure. uh, to yeah. add something to that. One of the elements being that, that there isn't any, um, I guess there, there wasn't any real validation of change that required an increase in, 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 in units per year. Like there's, there's nothing you know, from, from a, from our perspective, there's nothing here that really speaks to an urgency for these houses to get built faster than 25 units per year. Whereas the impacts of doing so do create an urgency and other, fa other factors of our, our communities. So. Okay. I don't know if you, if you can build that in or not. But. Oh, yes. Uh, Alicia can work one, uh, can work wonders. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm just I'm just going to uh, read this out and then you guys can just work from there. So um, that the Northwest Planning Advisory Committee has reviewed case 21639 and recommends not removing the growth management policies that restrict the limit of development of the Indigo Shore subdivision to 25 lots per calendar year due to the lack of information provided around the impacts on schools and traffic and the lack of valid reasoning to remove the growth, man growth management policies. Okay. Does that sound like what everyone wanted? Just You're very good, Alicia. <laughs> could, could, would it be possible, uh, Chair? Yes. Uh, to say in the beginning, and Andrea can say if that's possible to say it this way, that we reject at this time. Yeah, I think I think we could, that could work. Um, so that if information later on came to us that reassured us that there, you know, that we wouldn't have a negative impact, then we could revisit it. Yeah, I think so. How about that, uh, Alicia? Uh, yeah, well, I, well, okay. Um, just one sec. So um, that the Northwest Planning Advisory Committee has reviewed case 21639 and recommends not removing the growth management policies that restrict the limit of development of the Indigo Shore subdivision to 25 
lots per calendar year at this time due to the lack of information provided around the impacts on schools and traffic and the lack of valid reasoning to remove the growth management policies. Okay. I think that that is about as good as we could possibly make it. Can I? Ha okay. And Jacqueline uh, was, has moved that motion. Do we have a seconder? No seconder. And Donalda is seconding. So moved by Jacqueline, seconded by Donalda that we reject. Um, and I'm just um, want to see here what. <laughs> Madam yeah. Chair, um, Alicia has put the motion into the meeting chat. Yes, I see that. Yeah. Okay. She has uh, recommended remove, uh, not removing the growth management policies that restrict the limit of development of the Indigo Shore subdivision to 25 lots per calendar year at this time due to the lack of information provided on the impacts on schools and traffic and the lack of valid reasoning to remove the growth management policies. Okay, it's been moved by Jacqueline and seconded by Donalda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Contrary, Aye. contrary minded? Nay? Nay. Okay, we have the motion is carried with one dissenting vote. Okay. Thank you very much. And we did have uh, Mr. Uh, Ouellette on uh, listening in, and we thank him very much for that. And we'll ask you now to leave the meeting, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving along, we will go on to our next, huh, feels like we've been on, a, <laughs> had a long meeting already. Um, I'm lost. Okay, we are where? Yeah, okay. Our next, our next uh, case will be, Case number 23213, application by Clayton Developments to reduce the street frontage and lot area needed for lots with municipal sewer and water services in the Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville plan area. There'll be a presentation by Jennifer Chapman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to share my screen and uh, you can let me know if there's any issues with this. And there we are. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, great. Um, my name is Jennifer Chapman. I'm a planner on the Urban Enabled Application Team, and I'm here to present case 23213 to you tonight, which is, as the chair had already mentioned, a request by Clayton Development to amend the R1 zone standards uh, specific to lot size and lot frontage. So as mentioned, uh, the applicant is Clayton Development. And they're looking at changing the R1 zone standards within the urban service boundary. So that would be all of the lots that presently have uh, municipal services is, as in water and sewage and to amend the, uh, the lot size and lot frontage requirement from 60 feet of frontage and 6,000 square feet to 40 feet of frontage and 4,000 square feet in size. So this map here shows where the uh, proposed amendments would be, the, the properties that would be impacted. Um, the land shown in green are all the R1 lots that uh, are presently serviced by municipal services. And then you'll see in the uh, sort of central area there in the, more in the bottom, there's a couple of parcels of lands that have blue hatching. And these lands have, are currently subject to a development agreement 
which refers back to the R1 zone. So these lands would also be affected. The property at the very top that has the red star, this is this is a land that Clayton is specifically interested in developing. So this is what we call a carriage wood subdivision. And their interests, Clayton's interests are in developing, developing these lands with this reduced lot standard. Um, this application would go through this, the through our subdivision process. So it wouldn't, it would meet the requirements of the land use bylaw and wouldn't need discretionary approvals. So this slide shows a couple of pictures of uh, the typical built form in the area. You see Trinity Lane and Sherry Lane, and you get a sense that this is primarily a low density residential environment with single unit dwellings and varying lot sizes. So some developments existed pre-central servicing, so the lots had been larger and over time some have been subdivided. So this chart shows the difference in the R1 zone standards. So currently the minimum lot size in the R1 zone is 6,000 square feet and the applicant is requesting to reduce that to 4,000 square feet. Minimum lot frontage is 60 feet with the request to change that to 40 feet. The other uh, zone standards would not be changed so that there would still be the requirement for 35% lot coverage, 20 feet of setback in the front yard, eight feet in your rear and side yards and a maximum building height of 35 feet. So those would not be changed under this amendment. Oops. So the policy that allows us to consider this is policy P137, which gives council um, certain parameters to consider when considering amendments to the land use bylaw. Uh, the proposal has to conform with the requirements of other municipal bylaws and regulations. It directs council to consider the adequacy of services and existing infrastructure to ensure that controls are in place to reduce conflict with nearby uses and to consider the suitability of the site's natural features. The other policy that we evaluated when we're looking at this is policy P33. And this is the policy that establishes the residential designation. And the, pol the wording in this is very specific. It says within this designation, it shall be the intention of council to support and protect the existing low density residential environment. So the level of public engagement completed was consultation, which was achieved through a mail out notification, as well as a narrated present presentation and a survey that was up on Shape Your City. Feedback from the community generally included the following. Uh, there was concerns raised about increased traffic on an already busy Beaver Bank Road. Concerns raised about uh, stresses on other infrastructure and services, as we already heard about schools, uh, concerns about sewer and water impacts and fire. And there was concerns raised that it would negatively affect the character of the community, making it feel more urban uh, and less suburban. So of the 194 contributors for the survey, 89% of respondents said they think the lot size and frontage requirement should remain the same. The rest said they're okay with smaller lots or only in certain circumstances or location. So staff had mailed out 768 notifications and received 194 surveys. Uh, staff also received 11 phone calls and emails and there was almost 2000 unique web page views. So the question that staff is asking PAC at this point is really to provide some comment and feedback about whether or not the low density residential environment would be supported and protected with this change, as well as any other applicable land use impacts or issues that you may have. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude my presentation and 
open it up to questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. Or, no, Jennifer. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, it's just too many names for me tonight. Okay, uh, I'm going to, the clerk has, um, has something that she wants to share with the committee, I do believe. Actually, Anna? Madam Chair, do you want me to do that after people ask questions of, um, of Jennifer first, and then we can get to that issue? Okay, I was just following my... No, I just realized it probably would be more appropriate for okay. uh, Jennifer to answer questions first. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, we'll start then with Stacy Rotterham. Questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Jennifer. I'm just curious to know uh, what the increase in, in units would be in that site if we were um, to approve that change. And although the distances aren't changing um, between uh, units or the, the limits or whatever aren't changing, it's sort of forcing the, the, the change to take place, you know, where somebody has a lot more than eight feet uh, on the side of their um, their lot between their house and their lot, they're, they're sort of forced to, to be a little bit closer. So it doesn't change necessarily in, in the policy, but it's going to force the, the units a little bit closer together if, if we do approve that. Um, but I am curious to know how many, what, what the difference in units is for that, uh, for that property. If there's if they've done any kind of assessment of what they were, were intending to build, so uh, through you, Madam Chair, to uh, the committee member. At this point, we haven't we've we've spoke with Clayton Developments, and they've said they wanted to concentrate the development. Uh, I think there's a large wetland up in sort of the northern section of the site, so they wanted to concentrate the development away from that. So their intention, it would be to keep the number of units largely the same, but because it would be through and as a right process, there's no way that we could hold them to that. So they would be able to sort of subdivide under the land use bylaw. There is a process, um, a provincial process that they could go through to fill in a wetland. So we would have no, no ways of ensuring that that didn't happen to this Okay. okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Stacy. Uh, Donalda, your turn. Uh, no, I'll pass it for now. Thank you. Jacqueline. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm wondering if I'm trying to understand the reasoning behind this. Is it because the wetlands are more expensive to develop perhaps, or they want to keep out of it. And then they just want to be able to build the same amount on a smaller parcel of land. Is that, is that the reasoning behind the change in the size of the lots? For you, Madam Chair, uh, yes, that that's my understanding of the intention behind the request. However, it would be applied more broadly, it would be all the R1 zones within um, within the plan that are currently serviced. So it would be all of those properties shown on that map that are sort of near the Beaver Bank Road. Um, but yes, I, my understanding is that was the intention was to create smaller lots, create a bit a more dense fabric in uh, in that carriage wood subdivision. Thank you. Just one. I guess a comment that I would have to conclude is that I've just recently driven through that area, um, actually last week for, uh, which is funny. And I, and it, it, you know, it's a busy road and I think, wow, to make the houses even closer to the road than they actually are to the roads out there than they actually are. And to have, I, I don't know, it, 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 it seems to me like, the people who would be buying those houses would be losing something and more, you know, get, having more noise. I know it's only 20 feet, but it's, it, it just seems like we're on a slippery slope, I guess. A little bit would be my concern. Okay, thank you. 
Is there anything you want to comment on there, Jennifer? Okay. We'll move on then to Gina. Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, Jordan. Hi, nothing right now. Nick. Uh, one question. Um, and and one comment, uh, just so that my understanding is that, you know, the existing larger lots would now be able to be subdivided as well. So we may see some larger lot homes subdivided with, with more homes going in there. Um, my, my question through you, Madam Chair, is has Halifax Water been contacted about this possible increase in uh, infrastructure needs and is the capacity available? Okay, Jennifer, can you comment yes. on that? Yes, uh, through you, Madam Chair, to the committee member. Uh, yes, Halifax Water is involved in uh, early on in our, we have a team review process where we circulate to various agencies and boards and Halifax Water is one of those people. Uh, one of those agencies that uh, has been circulated and has provided feedback. And at this point, they don't have any concerns. Okay. Yes, Nick. You're, you're muted. <laughs> I was just giving her the thumbs up for a thank you. Thank oh, you. oh, okay. Okay. That was all you had to add then. Okay. And Councillor Diggle-Gammon. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess my, you know, we start this off saying that uh, there was a policy that says to protect low density, and this doesn't protect low density. It actually brings density into a suburban area, um, and the fact that it will then parlay into the other areas gives me a bit of concern because that's not what that community is. And we talk about when we talk about these developments and stuff, we talk about the community fit, and so for me, increased density in an area where the policy says we're going to protect low density doesn't seem to make uh, sense to me. That's not what people move away from the city for. Um, that's not why people move to a suburban area like Beaver Bank. So I, I kind of don't really like this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And I guess it's really not much Jennifer can comment on that. Right. Um, okay. Uh, myself, it seems to me that it wasn't that long ago that there was a moratorium put on development in the Beaver Bank area because of sewage concerns. Has that concern gone away? I'll ask that of Jennifer. Madam Chair, so there is areas of uh, growth constraints located within this area. Um, but none of these, they're all a bit further away from the site than this. So in this area, there's not any of those concerns. I, th I, th I, I believed uh, at the time that it was because the amount of sewage coming out of Beaver Bank, they had uh, to withhold some because it, of the volume going through the treatment plant in Bedford. Um, so I would think that any sewage coming out of Beaver Bank, no matter from where, would be all going to the same lines and to the same place. So um, how has that changed? Halifax Water has done a, a large project in the past um, looking at regional sewage flows and su regional sewage capacity. And they've done a lot of work over the past few years sort of redirecting those flows. So at this point, um, Halifax Water, when they reviewed it, they didn't raise any concerns. And I might, and then this is again, just my understanding of those projects, they probably helped alleviate some of the concerns that were in this area. Okay, thank you. And my last concern is, when you change the rules um, in a plan area, and this uh, covers Beaver Bank, um, I'm, <laughs> Beaver Bank, um, Hammond's Plains, 
and Upper Sackville. You're changing the rules for everywhere within that plan, correct? So that means that the same thing could happen uh, anywhere that there's water and sewer available in those three plan areas. Is that correct? Correct. So the, the impacted area one properties were those ones. Did you want me to share the screen again? Oh, no, I, I understand that uh, right now it's mainly in the Beaver Bank area because they have the water and sewer. The um, water uh, lines in Middle Sackville come up as far as the Lively Road, um, a little, maybe a little beyond there, I'm not, I, but I think the water and sewer is only up to as far as Lively Road in Middle Sackville. And I'm not sure on the Hammonds Plains Road, but I do believe that there's water and sewer in Lucasville. No? Okay. They're, they're, <laughs> they just drove right through there and, and went over to Hammonds Plains Road because I remember them putting lines in there. Is it They just... have water, but not sewer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but I wasn't sure how they, how they had done that. Okay. Those are my questions answered and <laughs> my concerns. Um, yes. I did want to just add then for the building on that comment, if sewer lines were extended further in the community, then that would open up uh, this okay. chain in other areas. Yeah, if the, if, if the sewer lines got extended, yes. Okay. Now I will, um, are there any other questions or comments from the committee? Yes, Stacy. You're muted. Just thinking about this, uh, sorry, Madam Chair, just thinking about this um, being such a broad uh, application. Um, I guess we're used to dealing with things on more of a site specific level and that sort of enables us to kind of wrap our brains around what could happen um, with regard to development. And I wonder why this is being dealt with on like such a broad kind of basis and not a site specific basis. I'm just, I'm just wondering why it's being done a little bit differently than what we're used to seeing. Okay, we'll ask Jennifer to answer that question for you. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, this application is enabled under current policy uh, only, and that would require a change to the R1 zone if uh, the applicant wanted to do a site specific uh, change that would require a change in the plan. So it would require a, a policy amendment. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Now I'm going to ask the clerk to share the information that uh, she has for you. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, I just want to let the committee know that prior to the meeting, the applicant sent a request to the clerk's office asking to make a submission to the Northwest Planning Advisory Committee. The committee does not schedule presentations from applicants. However, the committee can agree to receive a submission from any person who wishes to be heard. It is Planning Advisory Committee practice to only receive presentations regarding a planning application from HRN staff. The applicant speaks via the application documents that are reviewed by staff in their presentation to the committee. The applicant provides input regarding their application at several stages during the planning approval process, including a presentation at the public hearing. So Madam Chair, I'll, I'll move the floor over to you as to, um, to direct the committee in terms of how to proceed with this request. Okay, and Mike? Um, I, I have one, one other thing I would like to add to that is if we do this, um, we have to keep in mind that in the past we have turned down such requests. Um, and if we do this, we'll be setting a precedent, which could lead to having presentations from uh, proponents at every uh, time we look at anything. So I will then now ask you whether you agree 
to accept the applicant's request to make a submission to the committee. I'll ask you to raise your hands because it's easier than trying to catch your voices. For yes, for no, I would say the no's have it. Okay, we do not need a motion here. Um, and so what we've, what we've just said is that we will not hear the submission from the proponent. So we will now, um, we can continue the discussion, but it, it should be brief because we're running out of time. Or um, someone can make a motion on the question that we were asked to. And I think that the question that we're being asked for is if um, we should change the um, Allow a change to reduce the street frontage and lot area needed for lots with municipal sewer and water services in the Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains, and Upper Sackville Plan area. Okay, for that, we do need a motion. <laughs> Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Okay, one at a time. Who was the first? Nick. Nick was first. Okay. Madam Chair, um, I will gladly motion to um, deny this application. Uh, because it changes the committee, the community in a significant way, uh, and it, it it also puts stressors on uh, infrastructure such as uh, roadways and um, sewer and water. Okay. And Councillor Gammon, did you have something to add? Um, well, I just I respectfully I, I'm I think that the infrastructure has already been answered as being okay in terms of the, the Halifax water and stuff next so I'm not sure about that but I, I maybe would want to add a little bit to say that it doesn't protect the existing low density residential environment and is no longer a fit for the community yeah that's basically you both said pretty much the same things except for the infrastructure yeah piece there. Okay. Nick, do you agree with that amendment? Or? I do agree. Okay. So that would be a friendly amendment and we can just carry on. Um, okay. Is there a seconder uh, or would you like to second it? Okay. Donalda is seconding. So Nick has moved. Donalda has seconded that we, uh, yes, again, I'm forgetting the word. <laughs> we get Reject, thank you. I, I need two, two heads here. Um, to reject the uh, application as presented to us. Uh, and the motion is because it will significantly change the community. And is that correct? If I, have I got it pretty close? Yeah. And, and, uh, and it will impact the infrastructure as in roadways. Excuse me, say that again. It will impact infrastructure as in the roadway. Uh, yeah. Okay. And Madam Chair, it's Alicia. Do you want me to give you guys some wording? Yes, please. Um, that the Northwest Planning Advisory Committee has reviewed the application for case 23213 and recommends rejection of the application as it puts stresses on the existing infrastructure and doesn't protect the existing low density residential development and will significantly change the community. Okay, you've heard that. Yep. It's moved and seconded by Nick and Donelda. So all in favor, aye. 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 Contrary minded, nay. Hearing none, the motion is carried. Okay, thank you very much. And I would uh, like to thank uh, Stephanie Ma and Andrew Bone for being here on behalf of the applicant. And uh, I'll ask you now to leave the meeting. Thank you. 
so we have one more. <laughs> so bear with me. We have about 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer, uh, or is that going to give us enough time, do you think, or would you rather defer it? Can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? It, yes, just you're very low. I'll switch forward. Uh, I do think that we could get through this item. Okay, thank you. Then we'll try and be quick as we can. It's case number 212. 21826 Esquire and Travelers Motels, 771 and 773 Bedford Highway, Bedford. And the pre presentation is by Jennifer Chapman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will um, I'll try to be as brief as I need to be. So, as mentioned, this application is case 21826, which is Lands located at 771 Bedford Highway. Uh, this is what we call the Travelers or Esquire Motel. And the property has currently has a development agreement, which they are requesting to amend. Uh, the proposal is by Upland Planning and Design and is to allow for changes to expand the commercial uses, as well as to build a, a few new commercial buildings. So the site is located off Bedford Highway on the water side and is currently a mixed use commercial development that offers a range of small scale retail and restaurant opportunities to the north, as well as a former motel uses to the south. The land transitions to residential as you leave Bedford Highway to the east, but Bedford Highway remains largely commercial. So here we have a few pictures of the site. Um, the first is the, the top two are development at the western end and the bottom right is the motel as it is currently. So there's a longer list of changes. Uh, the first is to permit general business district zone uses to bring the development agreement in line with the underlying zoning to permit the full conversion of the Esquire motel site to commercial uses to create additional small commercial spaces uh, similar to what is currently on the site, to permit a removable module hotel to the rear of the Esquire site with 45 hotel units located in custom built modules with the same dimensions and shapes as shipping containers, to permit a removable module commercial complex on the northwest end of the site, to permit new accessory buildings to allow for storage, to enable subdivision of the property to place the Esquire motel on its own lot, to update this site plan to remove a building from in front of the former Travelers Motel to reflect the fact that this building is no longer in existence, as well as to allow the expansion of the Northwest parking area. So this shows the site plan. The, the building footprints you see in gray would be these new structures. So uh, four new buildings on the southeast end which would be um, the motel style uses, and then this, this structure at the other end, which would be a uh, removable commercial use. There will also be new parking and landscaping proposed at the front of the site uh, where the land abuts Bedford Highway. So currently the development agreement permits motels, general retail exclusive of mobile home dealerships, personal and household services, exclusives of massage, parlors, full-service restaurants, commercial photography, and office uses. And under the general business district zone, um, it would expand to include more office uses, clubs, full-service restaurants, daycares, neighborhood convenience stores, uh, general retail service. So a larger list of commercial uses, uh, similar to what is permitted in uh, lands that abut this property where this zone does currently exist. So the site is zoned CCDD, which is the Commercial Comprehensive Development District zoned, and it has the same designation. Uh, the existing use, as mentioned, is retail, restaurant, and assorted commercial, and policy C13 allows for the redevelopment of this site with a site-specific policy. 
So the policy directs council to consider um, notably two 30 foot wide separations between the buildings on either side of the entrance road to the waterfront project to provide views from the highway and from the existing homes above the site. So that is currently on the development in the development agreement and would be maintained under this uh, proposed amendment. Uh, the policy also directs that the buildings are to be set back 60 feet, a maximum building height of 75 feet and uh, subject to the implementation policy Z3, which speaks to the adequacy of the site for the development, um, the impacts of the existing of the proposal on existing infrastructure and any mitigation needed through land use and landscaping. So the level of engagement completed was consultation through a virtual PIM. Um, I only had one attendee at my PIM and they were fairly happy to see retail and small scale commercial continue in the area. Uh, it was uh, pretty lighthearted and um, actually quite enjoyable <laughs> public engagement. So we mailed out 170 notifications and I only received two phone calls about the project. Uh, I had over around 1500 unique web page views from January, 2020 to now. So the scope of review that staff is requesting uh, of planning advisory committee is to consider the design of the motel with the shipping container style. And if we're wondering if you have any comments or feedback about that and any concern with any of the proposed commercial land uses. So with that, I will open up the floor to uh, any questions. Okay. And thank you very much, Jennifer. Okay, now we're gonna try and get through this in our usual time. It's it's an unusual one for sure when we uh, when we talk about a motel made of shipping containers, but <laughs> everything's new these days. Okay, uh, I will now go to Donelda McIsaac and ask her for her comments or questions. I uh, guess I'm just a little taken back with it. I can't visualize the motel made out of containers, shipping containers. So. Um, what do they have around the area that they propose for to make it more attractive? Because in my mind, I'm just seeing shipping containers. So the, I don't know if you're familiar on the Halifax waterfront, there's a, a bike rental place and that, that currently uses a shipping container as a commercial space. Um, the applicant hasn't provided any drawings at this stage to indicate what this would look like, but they've included some, what I would call like inspiration boards where they've provided drawings to say, hey, these are some ways that these are, are being used. And essentially it's, you take a shipping container and you kind of stack them on top of each other and you paint them in an attractive manner and you, insulate and uh, kind of create it's, it's this industrial sort of design. So I don't know if that- I'm familiar with what you're talking about now. Okay. okay. All right, is that good, Donelda? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. And Jacqueline. Yes, I've just been searching online for pictures so I can have a picture for myself. And I've seen quite a few examples of motels that, you know, they add windows and, and they pretty them up and, and stuff. So I guess my question is, as I drive by every day, because this is very close to my home, um, you know, I saw the conversion of their first motel and then I see they're, you know, taking apart um, the Esquire as it stands now but they seem to be keeping the envelope of the Esquire motel. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, would they slip the containers? Like it, if I, <laughs> I, I can't see where the containers are going. I think that's what the, the, your picture was so small when it was up on your presentation that I, you know, I know that area, like the back of my hand, and I'm trying, I'm wondering if you can give more explanation from that slide, Jen, 
Jennifer through the chair. Yeah. I see Jennifer? the picture. I think you might be muted. Yeah, you are, Jennifer. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. Uh, this maybe just um, instead of sharing the screen, just zoom in on my slide. Okay. So, That's working well. Thank you. So hmm. you see these four building blocks located here at the rear. So they'd be kind of in behind the existing. Um, what is this? This is existing buildings there. They would have, and I think if there's a bit of a great change, they would have these uh, shipping container style motels. So if, if now I understand it better. Thank you, Jennifer. So as I understand, they're putting the shipping containers right up, <laughs> pretty much butting up against the track of the train, uh, I guess, with somewhat of a better view of the water, I guess would be the idea behind it. Um, and there would be, so they're keeping, what are they putting in the building in the front that they're keeping? Like that black and those black buildings, the envelope, what's that gonna be in front of the containers along the road? So I believe those are existing motels. So the, uh, the more strip retail style is on oh. the other end. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jacqueline. We'll move now to Gina. No, I don't have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Jordan. Uh, no, nothing for me. Thanks. Nick. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, is this intended to be a uh, temporary or a permanent installation? And um, are they going to be tying into sewer and water with these units as well? Uh, the intention is that they would be uh, temporary. They could easily take them down and move them. I think that was the attraction of the uh, sort of shipping container style as opposed to a, um, you know, I guess a proper built building. And yes, it would be on existing city services. So um, can you enlighten me on, um, does, does, this, does this all conform with code? Is, are there current codes for these types of installations? They would have to meet building code requirements. So I don't think that the building code um, would still treat it as a, you know, um, a hotel style use and they would have to meet the building code requirements for that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Councillor Diggle Gammon. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So I have actually seen um, containers uh, used in this way in other cities around Canada. And um, actually they can be quite attractive. Uh, St. John New Brunswick just uh, approved on their waterfront a whole commercial section that is using shipping containers and they're supporting local artists and entrepreneurs and all of that kind of stuff. So it has the potential to be a really unique um, sort of space. So I was actually kind of excited when I looked at this and saw it and I was like, yay, we're gonna do something like this here in uh, Bedford. So uh, I think it's kind of exciting and, and done well with all the right permitting, it's great. My only question is when we look at the, um, what is permitted in the zone, on that list was a recycling depot. And so the recycling depot on that list has me a little bit concerned because it is, you know, commercial issues, uh, commercial use, as well as the motel. And it's right there around the water. And I'm not so sure that a recycling depot um, as a permitted use would fit within that proposal at what we're looking at. Um, so I, I wonder if in our recommendation, we might get make a consideration to say uh, to exclude um, if we can exclude a recycling depot from, from uh, allowable use. Hmm. That would be my Jennifer. question. Yeah. For you, Madam Chair. So uh, as this is a development agreement, we can easily include the land uses that you would like and exclude the ones that you, you don't want. And that is some of the feedback that I am hoping to get if there's anything that you don't want to see or do want to see. 
Yeah, the recycling depot is the only one that I saw on the list that would give me some pause about uh, whether or not it would fit within the, the what they're proposing. Um, and so just to leave that open, I think on that site, a recycling depot doesn't fit for me in, in what that looks like. Okay, good. Thank you very much. And we'll go now to Stacy. Oh, there you are. <laughs> you keep moving. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't have any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And for myself, I would just hope that if it's going to happen, and it will probably um, snowball because it's. So, and I'm. I'm amazed. Uh, I keep hearing that the reason that. We're having so much trouble with shipping and everything being delayed on arrival is because of a lack of shipping containers, which are all sitting somewhere else waiting to be loaded onto ships. And uh, apparently there are surplus in Halifax. So <laughs> somebody should tell the shippers. But <laughs> um, as long as it can be done so that it does not look like shipping containers plunked down in a space. I, I don't see a real problem there. And the people uh, in Bedford didn't seem to see uh, find a problem with it. So um, I'm OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we will now just, OK, we've got two minutes, <laughs> or one minute, actually. But we can do that. Um, we will um, ask for a motion. And uh, if somebody would like to make that motion. And please. <laughs> Madam Chair, I can just put some draft wording in as per Councillor Digo Gammon is a starting point for somebody. I'll just paste it in the chat. Okay. And you can find it. Okay. 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 What she has here that mm -hmm. Northwest Planning Advisory Committee has reviewed the application for case number 21826 and recommends approval of the application with consideration given to excluding a recycling depot as a permitted use under the development agreement. I so move. Okay, moved by Councillor Deagle Gammon. A seconder, please. I second it. Uh, give you second a name. by Gina Jones Wilson. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. Seconded by Gina Jones Wilson that we uh, approve, as I just read. <laughs> and all in favor, aye. 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 Jordan, you're muted. I'm muted. Aye. And Stacy, you're muted. I said aye. Yeah. Okay. Good. So everyone has voted. Nick, did you? Did I hear from you? Uh, I would have liked to have heard more information on the uh, on the case, but I'll vote for it. Okay. Approval. Thank you. So it is has been. Uh, Everyone has been in favor and the motion has been carried. Okay. And I want to thank uh, the, and I can't find their name. <laughs> oh, yeah. he, he, Ian Watson on behalf of Upland Planning and Design. Uh, thank him for being here and ask him to leave the meeting now. Thank you. Okay. This has been a very confusing night for me. I don't know why, but it has. But uh, I just have left to uh, tell you that our next meeting will be on October 6th, 2021, and ask for a motion to adjourn. That shouldn't be hard to get. So moved. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. We don't need a seconder or, or a vote. Thank you. And thank everyone for watching and for being here. And thank you all for all your comments and questions.